Title Studio allows me to easily create and animate advanced lower thirds and other effects in a true 3D environment, and we're going to look at how to create those with Title Studio for Corel Video Studio Ultimate 10. Okay, so here I am in Corel, and I have a clip of this news anchor in my timeline. To access Title Studio, I'm just going to click on my Filter tab, and I can see Title Studio here. Now there are two ways to apply this. I can simply drag this effect right onto the clip, or I can create an overlay track and apply Title Studio to that instead. To create an overlay track, simply drag any media onto the timeline beneath the video track. I can add any media that I want, but in this instance, I'm going to simply duplicate my clip. That way I'm working with the same image. Now let's drag Title Studio right onto that clip. Now the first thing I want to do is adjust that overlay so that it matches the dimension of my clip. To do this, I'm going to right-click on the video and select Fit to Screen. Once that's done, I'm going to double-click on the track to open up the Attributes window. Here, I can adjust the basic attributes of the clip as well as customize Title Studio. To do that, I'm going to click here to launch my FX browser. Now for those who might be familiar with Graffiti's library browser, the FX browser functions quite similarly. I can select any number of factory installed presets, organize them by type, and preview it in the window over here. I can even quickly change the text down here. Let's change that to lower thirds with Title Studio. I'm going to click Insert Text, and there you go. Title Studio comes with a number of factory installed presets, all of which can help inspire you to create your own titles. And we'll explore this in a bit. But for now, let's hit Apply. Okay, if I play back my clip, that's looking pretty good. Now the reason I prefer to work with overlay layers is because this allows me to adjust my effect duration without needing to worry about the clip it appears on. If I'd applied it directly to my Anchorman clip, then it would have been much more complicated to adjust the timing. This way, all I have to do is trim my clip, and the title will update accordingly. Okay, so let's go back to the FX browser. I can access this again by clicking Customize Filter. Presets are all well and good, but I want to create something myself. To do this, I'm going to click Advanced Mode to launch the Title Studio user interface. Now inside of Title Studio, I have my Controls and Text Entry window, my Composite window, and my Timeline. There are a number of different workspaces available, and if I want to change the layout, I can create my own. At the moment, I've enabled multiple camera views, which include my render camera and a world camera. This is going to allow me to quickly see not just where my objects are positioned in 3D space, but also what the final render will look like. For now, let's look at the original video clip I used at the beginning of this tutorial. Now you can see that this lower third is comprised of four spline shapes that animate on, as well as some text. While each spline shape is individually built and animated, with Title Studio I can make quick work out of this. To begin with, let's start by creating a spline shape. I can do this by selecting Spline Object from the Add New Media button. I can also do this from the Track menu or by pressing Ctrl-Alt-L. When I do, this creates a new track with a number of control options for its masking, shape, and path. To create the parallelogram shapes we see here, I'm going to select the Rectangle tool and draw a quick mask. Note that when I do, a new spline object appears in my path track. This track should always be selected when making changes for the shape of my rectangle. With the spline object and pen tool selected, I'm going to grab the left and right corner points and drag them to create the pointed edges. I can hold Shift to snap the guides in place to help me keep a straight edge. Once I have it the way I want, I can reposition it by selecting the Hollow Arrow tool. Available tools are context sensitive, so if the Hollow Arrow tool isn't available, make sure your Spline Object track is selected. When that's done, I can come over to my Controls window, and again, making sure that my Spline Object is selected, choose the Fill tab. This tab contains controls for changing the color and gradient of my object. I have other tabs to adjust the border, drop shadow, and texture, but for now, I'm just going to click on that color chip and change it to a dark blue. Lastly, I'm going to right-click on the main spline track and select Rename. Since I'll be dealing with multiple tracks, let's rename this Lower Blue. Okay, so to create the other tracks, I'm going to duplicate this track three more times. If the timeline becomes too cluttered, I can simply collapse each track here until I'm ready to work with it. For each track, I'm going to select the spline object and hollow tool and reposition the new track somewhere on the screen. Right now it doesn't matter where, so long as I can see each one. I want to make sure that I'm using the hollow arrow tool when I select these objects, and not the regular arrow or the OpenGL interactors. I'm going to position one of the spline objects a little bit above and to the right of the original. Since this spline is largely identical, I'm going to right click and rename this Upper Blue. Next, I'm going to select one of my duplicates, and I'm going to use my hollow arrow tool to position it between the upper and lower splines. I can select my fill parameter and change the color chip to white. I can then use my pen tool to extend the shape so that it's longer, thereby creating the backdrop my text will eventually go on. 
With a little bit of adjusting, I can create something that looks like this. When I'm satisfied, I'm going to right-click and rename this new track Backdrop. Lastly, I'm going to take the final duplicate spline and position it above my backdrop. Now stacking order plays a big role here. I want this spline to sit on top of the others. So to do that, I want to make sure that it's at the top of my stack. To position this, I can simply click on the track and drag it to the top. Once I do that, I can select my spline object and pen tool, and this time I'm going to reshape it so that it links the first two splines. When I have things the way I want, I'm going to go to my Fill tab and change the color to a lighter blue, and then rename it Middle Spline. Now that's looking pretty good, but it needs some text. To do this, I'm going to go back to my Add Media button and add flat text. With the text added, I can go to the Text Generator window and fill in anything I want. For example, Lower Thirds with Title Studio. Within my Text Generator window, I can adjust the font, size, color, shadow, and other controls to create a specific style. I can also go to the Windows menu and select a style palette and even create my own text, font, color, gradients, and other styles. Now if you remember before, when I was working with splines, by selecting the spline object I gained access to parameters that controlled the overall look of the spline. The same is true for text objects. By selecting the material track here, I can access parameters for fill, border, and drop shadow, as well as type on and generator effects to animate my text on and off the screen. For this tutorial, however, I'll keep my text simple, but feel free to experiment with yours. Okay, now that I have a nice lower third already, the final thing I need to do is animate it. If we look back at the original animation, the splines draw on and the backdrop slides into place. To recreate this effect, I need to adjust the individual splines masks. I'm going to begin by selecting the lower blue track. With my CTI on the first frame, I'm going to select the texture track and, in the control window, select the crop texture tab. This allows me to modify the cropping for the layer. Since this spline animates on top to bottom, I'm going to set the interpolation for bottom to linear. This creates a keyframe on the very first frame and I can adjust the mass so that the spline object is no longer visible. Then I can move my CTI forward about 5 or 10 frames, and I can create a new keyframe. I can do this by clicking the Add Keyframe button here, and then adjusting the bottom parameter so that the spline is now visible. Since I want the animation to stop here, I'll select a Hold Interpolation. If I scrub through, I can see that my spline animates on. I'll do the same thing with each of the blue splines, and to ensure that they begin where the previous spline ends, I'll simply adjust the position of my keyframe by dragging it in my timeline. For my middle spline, I will animate this upward, so I will repeat the exact same process as before, only this time I'll be adjusting the top parameter. For the upper blue spline, I can animate the bottom mass position so that it draws downward. Every keyframe that I create is adjustable in my timeline, so I can fine-tune the animation duration by adjusting the distance between each keyframe. Feel free to experiment with different interpolation types such as Accelerate, Decelerate, and Ease In to get different animation looks. For the background track, I'm going to animate it sliding into frame. I can achieve this by adjusting the start of the animation, and instead of the Crop Texture tab, I'm going to go to the Position tab. I'll set a linear interpolation on the position X and move it off screen. Then I'll move forward a few frames until I get to the point where the upper blue spline finishes its animation and I'll create a new keyframe. I'll then adjust the position X so that it slides into place, again placing a hold interpretation on the last keyframe. Finally, I want my text to appear. Now there are a lot of options available to me. I can have the text fade in, type on, or slide on. In this instance, I'm going to repeat the same thing I did with the backdrop, but I'm going to animate the position X so that it animates on from the left. But here's the thing, it looks kind of weird if I can see it before the backdrop has finished animating, and it looks odd to see it on part of the screen where there is no backdrop. So here's something cool. First off, I want to drag my text track and position it above the backdrop, but below the middle spline track. This will cause the text to animate on under the middle spline. Then I can go to the Crop Output tab and set my left distance to a constant interpolation, and adjust it so that the mask overlaps the middle spline. This will prevent the text from being seen on the left of the screen where I don't want it. When that's done, I can play back my animation, and there you go! Now one thing that I can see in my world view is that occasionally I get this distortion in my image. This is because Title Studio is a fully 3D environment, and every track in my animation is occupying the same position in Z-Space. Basically, they're right on top of each other. This can cause flickering and distortions in some cases, even if the render camera shows a clean effect. To fix this, I can adjust the splines ever so slightly in my world camera so that they no longer occupy the same space. 
When I have things the way I like it, I can just click Apply and send it right back to my clip. Title Studio has a lot to offer, so try experimenting with different animation styles and effects to create the look that works for you.